good evening. Uh, this evening, uh, I greet the Deputy Vice Chancellors, uh, especially uh, Dr. Mkwebi, who's uh, uh, participating in the event this evening. I greet uh, all the executive deans of faculty, and particularly uh, the acting executive dean of the Faculty of Law, Dr. Lynn Biggs. And I also want to greet uh, our dean uh, uh, of law, uh, Professor Avinash Govinji, who I understand is watching the proceedings. Uh, thank you very much for that, uh, uh, Professor. Uh, colleagues uh, in the Faculty of Law, uh, I would like to greet this morning, this afternoon, and then especially the colleagues in the Department of Criminal and Procedural Law, which is the home uh, of Professor Arasmus. Uh, professors that are watching uh, the proceedings and all members of our academy and other members of the academy that are watching uh, and participating in this event. Uh, I would also want to greet the members of senior management of the university, our students, uh, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, family members, friends and colleagues who are sharing in this wonderful online celebration. I am pleased to welcome you all this evening on the occasion of the inaugural lecture of our colleague, Professor Dion Erasmus. I particularly wish to acknowledge and welcome Professor Erasmus's family and extended family and friends. Especially, I would like to greet his wife, Ronel, and their daughters, Madil and Tamar, uh, whose constant love, encouragement, and support have contributed in no small measure to this momentous achievement. We share in your joy and your pride at this, the ultimate academic and professional honor for our colleague, Professor Dion Erasmus. A special welcome also goes to Professor Erasmus's friends and colleagues in the Faculty of Law, especially uh, his department, as I've said, the Department of Criminal and Procedural Law, who have supported and encouraged him on the road to this zenith in his work and in his scholarly achievement. I am sure, like us, they are all overjoyed at this moment. The support of family, friends and colleagues resides at the center of our success as individuals and as professionals. They keep us grounded. They are our self harbors At times, they are shepherds and mentors who help us keep focused and buoyed in tough times, or when our energies have flagged and we have needed a nudge in the right direction, we acknowledge and salute your various contributions. Let me congratulate you, Professor, on your outstanding achievement. Being promoted to the level of a full professor is the definitive affirmation of your accomplishment as an academic and as a scholar. Ladies and gentlemen, it is always a matter of personal pride and pleasure when one of our own is acknowledged by their peers and the academic community. And this evening is no exception, especially where their life's work is of such relevance and importance at a time when we see widespread erosion of ethical leadership and deep-seated impunity in adhering to the laws of the land and dictates of responsible stewardship as anticipated in our constitution. On the eve of municipal elections next week, one descends the quite cynical and dis disenchantment uh, among citizenry uh, who feel betrayed, failed, and let down by those whose promises of upliftment now ring hollow in the light of rampant and incessant corruption and almost total state capture that we are experiencing. One has noted over the past decade, and more in fact, uh, that the so-called thin blue line against complete collapse and anarchy has been buttressed by two key entities. The first is a free press that is nevertheless undergoing under ongoing and continuous threat and attack. And the second, Professor Erasmus, is our constitution and an independent judiciary who have quite remarkably weathered one assault after the other on their integrity and independence. 
It is in, that, in this context then, Professor, that your work assumes such significance. On the one hand, we acknowledge that in line with our constitution, the state has a legal duty to address social inequalities and to oversee a fair and equitable distribution of state resources to all members of society. And yet, in reality, a picture of stark gross societal inequality and precarity, especially amongst the most vulnerable in our society, is shamefully still evident. It is now generally agreed that the rot must uh, be cut out and the, corruption must, uh, the corrupt people must be held accountable for their action and its impact on society and our citizen. Uh, this process, I have a feeling, is about to begin. Your work is a timely reminder, Professor, that South Africa does, in fact, have a large arsenal of anti-corruption instruments and remedies, which it can and it must employ in the institution of criminal prosecutions against public officials, corrupt operators in the private sector, and politicians and public servants involved in corrupt activities. You go one step further to offer practical suggestions on how this can be done. As such, your work presents a timely and much needed focus and decisiveness that will buttress the work being done and add to the body of knowledge which is available to draw on in this time of impunity and concomitant uh, needs, need for redress. Professor Erasmus's work is scaffolded by formidable academic accomplishments an exemplary teaching, professional and publications record, as well as various forms of engaged scholarship, which we have come to know our law faculty for. This is a testament to his enduring commitment to expanding the body of work in his field, while making sure that it does find practical expression and relevance in our efforts to redress the gross inequality and corruption in our nation. As a university in service to society, of society, we are indeed honored that at this point in your career, Professor, we have chosen to remain here as part of our family at Nelson Mandela. We are very proud of your accomplishments and we eagerly look forward to listening to your lecture this evening. Congratulations again. I now request uh, the acting executive dean, uh, Professor Lynn uh, Bix, to introduce Professor Erasmus. I thank you, Nkosi Mazenetol. Nkosi. Good evening, Madam Vice-Chancellor. Madam Deputy Vice-Chancellor and other uh, Deputy Vice-Chancellors and Executive Deans, Senior Academics, students and colleagues and friends who are joining us online. A special greeting to uh, Prof. Vivian Lavac um, from University of uh, Western Cape and Professor Avinash Gavanji and all the colleagues of the Faculty of Law who are also joining us virtually. And a special greeting as well to Renal and Medil and Tamar who are here with us this evening. We are thrilled to share this special occasion with Dion's friends and family and colleagues. Thank you for all the support that you have provided to Dion over the years and especially leading up to this momentous achievement in his academic career. Madam Vice-Chancellor, I'm honored and privileged to introduce Professor Dion Erasmus to the audience. He obtained a B. Juris cum laude from the University of Port Elizabeth in 1982 and an LLB cum laude from the University of Port Elizabeth in 1984 and then an LLD from the University of the Free State in 1999 with the title of his dissertation being Simplification of the South African Criminal Trial Process, a Psycholinguistic Approach. If you have the opportunity to walk through the recently renovated offices of the Faculty of Law, 
you will find Dion's name on the honors boards at the entrance to the faculty, where we have honored cum laude students and other alumni. Dion commenced his legal career in 1984 at the Department of Justice, where he was first a public prosecutor in Hrafrenet, then a senior public prosecutor also in Hrafrenet, a regional court prosecutor in East London, state advocate in Grahamstown, and then state advocate in Port Elizabeth. During this time, he was admitted as an advocate of the High Court of South Africa in 1987. He then passed the National Bar Examination, was admitted as an associate member of the Port Elizabeth Bar in 1984, 1994, sorry, and passed the attorney's admission examination and was ad admitted as a practicing attorney of the High Court in 1997. Dion's academic career commenced at Vista University from 1992 and went on until 2003, where he was appointed as a senior lecturer in public law and served as the head of department of public law and program coordinator of the Port Elizabeth Faculty of Law. The, mo the merger saw Dion move to the Faculty of Law on South Campus and has been a part of the Nelson Mandela University Faculty of Law since 2004, initially as a senior lecturer in the Department of Criminal and Procedural Law from 2004, and then he was promoted to an associate professor in 2012 and now full professor in 2020. He was appointed as head of Department of Criminal and Procedural Law in 2012 and now again in 2020 and he currently serves as head of Department of Criminal and Procedural Law. He is also currently the program coordinator for the Higher Certificate in Law Enforcement and the program coordinator of the Coursework Masters in Criminal Justice. He has supervised 25 LLM coursework treatises and one LLM research dissertation. And since 2014, he has seen three of his doctoral candidates walk across the stage, and his fourth doctoral student and colleague will graduate now in December. Dion has exter uh, externally examined three LLM research dissertations and four LLD theses for Rhodes University, University of Pretoria, University of Zululand, and has also served as external examiner for the Criminal Law LLB module at Walter Sassoula University and the LLM coursework assignments at the University of Stellenbosch. Dion has been actively involved as an external peer reviewer for eight accredited South African journals and serves as an editorial board member of the Baltic Journal of Euro Euro European Studies. Dion's research has allowed him to participate in various exchange programs and present guest lectures as a visiting professor at universities in the United States, Mauritius, Slovenia, and the Czech Republic. He has been delivering conference papers since 1992 at national and international conferences, having attended and presented papers at 19 local conferences and eight international conferences. These hosted in the USA, Wales, Ireland, Namibia, Argentina, China, India, and Mauritius. Dion has contributed significantly to the body of knowledge, mostly in relation to criminal and procedural law, by having 21 submissions published in accredited journals. The topics range from the Sexual Offences Act to undefended accused persons, child witnesses, media coverage in the courtroom, and that being the, the Oscar Pistorius case, money laundering and cryptocurrency, and then the life Esedemini tragedy. The Faculty of Law recognized Dion for his research contributions by awarding him the Faculty of Law Emerging Research of the Year in 2008 and the Faculty of Law Research of the Year in 2017. This is merely a snapshot of the work carried out by Dion and the contribution he has made to the Faculty of Law and the institution over the past few decades. Dion, your CV has shown that you have traversed so many fascinating, topical and relevant areas of criminal and procedural law and we look forward to being taken along a thought-provoking journey during your inaugural lecture this evening on corruption, state capture, and the betrayal of South Africa's vulnerable. 
We wish you everything of the best and many more fruitful and knowledge creation researching years ahead of you as a full professor. Congratulations, Dion. Um, Madam Vice-Chancellor, I now call upon Professor Dion Erasmus to deliver his inaugural lecture to us. Um, Madam Vice-Chancellor, Madam Deputy Vice-Chancellor, and Madam Acting Dean, and other um, executives and DVCs um, present tonight, members of the small audience, and all of you joining us via um, online means. Uh, the topic of my um, inaugural lecture is a stated corruption, state capture, and the betrayal of South Africans vulnerable. I've divided the lecture into five parts, and um, I'm starting off each one with um, an apt quote, and I will take us from the time of Rome through to far in the future. Joe Biden, when he was still Vice uh, uh, President of the United States, said, Corruption is a cancer, a cancer that eats away at the citizen's faith in democracy, diminishes, diminishes the instinct for innovation and creativity. In his definitive work, Corruption and the Decline of Rome, Macmillan made the following summation. Bribery and abuses always occurred, of course, but by the fourth and the fifth centuries, they had become the norm, no longer a system but an alternative system in itself. The cash nexus overrode all ties. Everything was bought and sold. Public office, access to authority on every level, and particularly the emperor. The traditional web of obligations became a marketplace of power, ruled only by naked self-interest. Government's operation was permanently, massively distorted. Transparency International defines corruption as the abuse of entrusted power for private gain. The main effects of corruption are the eroding of trust, the weakening of democracy, and the hampering of economic development. It further exacerbates inequality, poverty, social division, and environmental crisis. The term state capture was first defined in a World Bank report on corruption in Eastern Europe and Central Asia in 2000. Hellman, Jones and Kaufman point out in the report that some firms in trans transition economies were able to shape the rules of the game to their own advantage at a considerable social cost by creating a capture economy. In this captured economy, public officials and politicians privately sell underprovided goods and range rent generating advantages to individual firms. Rent seeking is an economic concept that occurs when someone wants to gain added wealth without contributing a reciprocal contribution of productivity. This form of wealth gain often revolves around government funded social services and associated programs. Rent seeking may not necessarily be illegal, but it is unethical as those who seek favors and privileges benefit from the productive efforts of others. It challenges the goodness of human nature and it insulates that public policies relating to redistribution of income are subject to political response. It therefore contradicts the principle that government officials should behave with social responsibility to maximize social welfare by means of ethically based distribution. This concept is con contrasted with state capture, 
where firms are shaping and affecting the formulation of the rules of the game through private payments to public officials and politicians with influence, and administrative corruption such as petty forms of bribery regarding the implementation of laws, rules and regulations. The term state capture was needed to describe the extraordinary tactics that certain firms owned by oligarchs were using to attain and maintain their dominance of the market. This theory assisted in explaining the oligarchs hold over the fragile democracies of the uh, former Soviet bloc. The concept is nowadays applied more broadly, describing an array of dubious dealings between corporations and governments worldwide. Fisekis and Toth indicate that state capture does not equate to widespread corruption. Its defining feature is the distinct network-like structure in which the corrupt cluster around those parts of the state which will allow them, in cohort with their private goals, to the detriment of the public good. Part two, state of capture. Rigoberta Menchu said, without strong watchdog institutions, impunity becomes the very foundation upon which systems of corruption are built. And if impunity is not demolished, all efforts to bring an end to corruption will be in vain. The former public protector Tuli Maruncela published a report entitled State, Cap State of Capture in 2016. This report sets out the way in which former President Jacob Zuma and senior government officials colluded with corrupt brokers. The report also sets out the involvement of the Gupta family in the appointment and dismissal of cabinet ministers, directors of state-owned enterprises. These actions resulted in the improper and corrupt awarding of state contracts to the business empire of the Gupta family. The evidence revealed that the Guptas offered bribes and or appointments in exchange for benefits. The former president and or his family members were either present or present at or facilitated these meetings where the corrupt activities took place. The Judicial Commission of Inquiry into Allegations of State Capture, now known as the State Capture Commission, was instituted on the 23rd of January 2018 to investigate allegations of state capture, corruption, fraud, and other allegations in the public sector, including organs of state. Ironically, this commission was instituted by former President Jacob Zuma himself to inve investigate allegations of state capture and is led by Deputy Chief Justice Zondu. This commission has the power to refer any matter for prosecution to institute a further investigation or to convene a separate inquiry to the appropriate law enforcement agencies, government departments or regulator. After the revelations made by witnesses who testified before the Commission, there can be no doubt that the state was captured by former President Zuma and his cohorts. Testifying at the Zondu Commission of Inquiry into State Capture, President Ramaphosa admitted that leaders and members of the ANC had been part of state capture. State capture took place under our watch, he told Judge Sondu. The public protector's report revealed the presence of a powerful and influential oligarchy which existed outside of former government structures, but, par uh, but parallel to important public officials. This evil partnership led to a direct drain on the monetary resources of the state. Money that could have been used for socio-economic development was redirected from the poor and destitute directly into the bank accounts of the rich. The contracting state made the capturing of and final destruction of state-owned enterprises an easy task. Many of the revelations which emanated from the evidence led before the Zondu Commission focus on the relationship between the Zuma family, the former president, and the Guptas, three Indian brothers who moved to South Africa after the fall of apartheid. This wealthy family had control over resources of the country by using state companies for their personal enrichment. The close, closeness of these families led to the use of the blended word 
the Zuptas. The Guptas owned a portfolio of companies which were awarded lucrative, lucrative contracts by the South African government and SOEs. The Guptas employed several Zuma family members, including the president's son, Dudazani. The relationship became so corrupt that the Guptas went to great lengths to service their most, most important client, the South African state. They directly instructed public officials in charge of state bodies to take specific decisions that would favor their business interests. Compliance was rewarded with payoffs and promotions, while failure to obey led to dismissal. We now know that the public bodies that were captured included the departments of finance, natural resources, and public enterprises. It even included government agencies in charge of tax collection and communication, the SABC, SIA, Transnet, and ESCOM, at one time one of the world's largest utility companies. Zuma's part in the scheme lay with the promotion and dismissal of public officials, including ministers, boards of directors of SOEs, and the heads of law enforcement agencies, such as the South African Police Services, investigative agencies, and even the National Prosecuting Authority. Madonsela points out that the idea of utilizing governmental procurement procedures to achieve social and economic outcomes was not a new one in South Africa. In the 1930s, it was employed as a central platform of the apartheid project. The post-1994 South African government introduced a wide spectrum of policies aimed at the reallocation of resources across a broad range, broad range of public sectors, which included housing projects, social grants, black economic empowerment strategies, preferential procurement, large investments in educa education and land reforms. These efforts were according to an ANC discussion document of 2017, the second phase of the transition from apartheid colonialism to a national democratic society. The government accordingly transformed into a tender generating machine, which was described as a contracting state. This in turn paved the way for opportunities of entrenching clientelism, which is the creation of a patronage network that is dependent on the favor of top decision makers. Job Mahoro, the former premier of the North, Northwest province, who was recalled, revealed during, a, revealed during an interview that four big mining companies offered to provide a free water project to supply water to the residents of Beng. They offered the services of engineers, project managers, and funding Municipal officials, however, were not in favor of the project because if the water was provided for free, there would be no procurement processes and no opportunity to loot the funds of the council. He refers to this type of behavior as a dangerous culture of instant wealth. Labskagni correctly points out that the regulatory role of government as the principal agent in a state is of critical importance to a de developmental state. One of the main functions of such a de developmental context is to address social inequalities and to oversee a fair and equitable distribution of state resources to all members of society. It's abundantly clear that state capture seriously compromised the equitable distribution of state resources. In terms of Section 7.2 of the Constitution, the state is compelled to respect, protect, promote, and fulfill a broad range of economic rights. Nahang correctly points out that these obligations on the state actually amount to a rule of law and must be fulfilled, either by way of taking positive action to implement rights or to refrain from action that would limit the full realization of these rights. Section 26.2 and 27.2 qualify the positive obligations on the state by requiring the state to take reasonable legislative and other measures within its available resources to ensure that the entitlement promised by the rights are progressively achieved. 
Our courts recognised the positive obligations on the state and made orders compelling the state to give effect to these obligations. For instance, in the well-known case of the Republic of South Africa versus Grootboom, the Constitutional Court issued a declaratory order that the state must meet its obligations in terms of Section 26.2 by devising, funding, implementing and supervising a measure to provide relief for persons in desperate need. Likewise, in Minister of Health versus, versus Treatment Action Campaign, the Constitutional Court issued an order requiring public health officials to make nevirapine available to all public health facilities and to plan and implement an effective national program to prevent mother-to-child HIV transmissions. Despite the promises, guarantees and obligations of the Constitution, unacceptable and unsustainable levels of poverty and inequality prevail. There remains widespread unemployment, a lack of access to basic services for poor communities and continued violation of the rights of people causing persistent economic, social and political unrest. Governments should employ mechanisms to ensure that goods and services are procured at reasonable prices. These mechanisms should be transparent, rigorous, uh, rigorously adhered to, and conducted with meticulous oversight. Corruption in the use of public funds constitute a clear violation of the obligations of the state to use these funds in an efficient way as mandated by the Constitution. Part three the COVID-19 relief fund heist. Pope Francis said, corruption is paid by the poor. South Africa's, population, South Africa's population is estimated at 55 million people in 2025, of which, oh, sorry, 2015, of which 19.7 million were children under the age of 18 years. According to the latest report, released by Stat South Africa, more than 60% of children were multidimensionally poor. These are children who live in households where they are deprived of at least three of seven dimensions of poverty, namely health, housing, nutrition, protection, education, information, water, and sanitation. Child poverty and the deprivation have an impact on the physical, psychological and social development of a child. These children will miss out on key aspects of their lives, which will deprive them of developing their full potential. The Borgen Project reveals that the South African adult population does not fare much better on the poverty index. Nearly half of the adult population lives in poverty and women are generally more vulnerable to poverty. Poverty headcounts in rural areas are significantly higher than those in urban areas. A study by the World Bank proves that South Africa's inequality of opportunity is higher than any other countries. That is um, the inequality measured by access to quality basic services, including education and health care. As of 2021, South Africa, with an income of less than 890 rand per month, are considered poor. Individual having merely 624 rand a month available for food were living below the poverty line. 16.3 million individuals in South Africa were living under 1.9 US dollars per day which is the interna international absolute poverty threshold. Lastly, South Africa remains the country with the highest Gini co coefficient, a statistical measure of distribution intended to represent the income or wealth distribution in a country. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit South Africa, emergency measures were put in place to address the pandemic. It was clear that the poor would be the worst hit by the COVID-19 pandemic, and that made them even more vulnerable. These measures included a 500, million, sorry, a 500 billion rand 
relief package to provide, provide food parcels for the needy, a temporary social grant increase for over 16 million beneficiaries, and a temporary employer-employee relief scheme for those whose salaries were affected. Emergency procurement regulations were put in place to implement these and other measures. Transparency International commented that these emergency measures have proved irresistible to those with thieving tendencies. The release of this relief package led to corruption on a grand scale. The abuse of TERS funds was partly enabled by private firms who claim benefits on behalf of ignorant or ghost employees and even deceased people. These funds were then pocketed by the firms. The Special Investigative Unit, SIU, is currently probing a large number of firms for UIF fraud. The private sector was also complicit in abusing, uh, abusing the procurement procedures of personal protective equipment, which led to the looting of billions of rands which should have been utilized in the response plan. Although it's unlawful for public, service in South, public servants in South Africa to do business with the state, the emergency regulations enabled corrupt government officials and politicians to misappropriate millions of rands by means of dubious deals with corrupt companies who suddenly entered the PPE market. The following response from Kingsley Klubartler, the chairman of the Black Pharmaceuticals Industry Association, actively exposes the corruption. He says, why did government now suddenly procure PPE goods, which we, were, we are licensed to sell, from companies that normally operate as IT service providers, building contractors, and engineering firms? The result of this was the looting of the public purse through irregular contracts and inflated prices, particular in the healthcare sector. It, allege, it is alleged that one company, owned by a relative of a provincial premier, received a tender worth 200 million rand to supply vaccines. This company was only registered in January 2021. The social relief grant of a mere 350 rand per month per beneficiary was meant for the unemployed and those dependent on an income from the informal business sector. It is estimated <clears throat> that less than half of those eligible have received the grant, while others, including government employees, convicted prisoners, and convicted prisoners successfully claimed them. It's also alleged that a syndicate operating in Brits in the Northwest province has been able to access the social relief grants from the post office before it could reach the intended beneficiaries with the alleged assistance of post office officials. Part four, the, the betrayal of the vulnerable. John Lynch said, we have a responsibility as a state to protect our most vulnerable citizens, our children, seniors, people with disabilities. That, um, that is our moral obligation. But there is an economic justification too. We all pay when the basic needs of our citizens are not, are unmet. Large numbers of, South, of the South African population can be classified as vulnerable, in which in current human rights rhetoric is normally referred to in collective terms. It is argued that vulnerable groups should be afforded special protection as their rights are perceived to be particularly open to violation. Vulnerability is mostly associated with concepts such as victimhood, deprivation, dependence, or pathology. Other examples are children, persons living in poverty, or confined to state institutions such as prisons and health care facilities or mental care facilities. Feynman's vulnerability theory is rooted in feminist jurisprudence and aligned to the care theory, establishing caring as a viable moral and political concept. She defines the human condition as one of universal 
and continuous vulnerability. Vulnerability is a condition which arises from our very human embodiment, which is exposed to an omnipresent possibility of being exposed to harm, injury, and misfortune. As humans, we may attempt to lessen the occurrence of these risks or lessen the impact they are. The possibility of these risks occurring cannot be eliminated and is thus beyond our human control. There is accordingly an ever-present possibility that humans may become dependent on others as a result of biologically based catastrophes such as diseases or epide uh, epidemics. The current COVID-19 pandemic is a prime example of such a risks. Humans are in addition vulnerable to physical forces occurring in the environment which they live, such as fire, floods, drought and famine. As a result of the fact that we cannot avoid our state of vulnerability, humans turn to societal institutions to assist and protect them against their inherent vulnerability. Society cannot eliminate human vulnerability, but it can and does address human vulnerability through the creation of programs, institutions, and structures for that purpose. Some of the legitimized and empowered social institutions can assist some people to recover quickly from their difficulties, while other institutions may impact negatively on their recovery process. The state must therefore accept responsibility for these institutions. Feynman correctly argues that the actions of state-empowered institutions should be scrutinized as their role in providing assets in ways that may unfairly privilege certain persons or groups. Just as is the case with individuals, institutions are vulnerable to both internal and external forces. Empowered institutions are capable of being captured or corrupted. If state institutions fail to exercise their duties effectively and fairly, the state will have to rectify the position by either justifying the unequal treatment or acting positively to adjust institutional arrangements. According to Lessig, institutional corruption occurs when, it is, when an ostensibly legal or current ethical strategy of an institution has the effect that it undermines the effectiveness of the institution by weakening its ability to achieve its purpose. The, the result is the weakening of the purpose of the institution or the trust of the public in the institution. The vulnerability theory argues for a development of a more responsive state. The state is constituted for the common benefit of all and not just a select few. It is submitted that the concept of Ubuntu, enshrined as a fundamental constitutional value in our constitution, is akin to the philosophy underlying the care and vulnerability theories. A prime example of the neglect of the vulnerable occurred in 2015, when the Gauteng Health Department terminated its contract with Life Esidemeni, who supplied caring facilities to mental, care, mental health care users in the psychiatric homes it operated. This led to random mass discharges of patients who were moved to hospitals and NGOs or returned to their family homes. These irrational decisions resulted in the death of at least 144 patients and about 50 patients are still unaccounted for. The examples of corrupt activities associated with the COVID-19 relief funding outlined in the previous part clearly indicate that the very state departments empowered to care for the vulnerable became corrupted to the core. Labiskagni correctly argues that the current state of affairs is the result of greed and immorality of public officials, politicians, and members of the private sector. These corrupt acts were initially condoned as the battle against apartheid was the focus of the ruling party. The historical and political motivation for the freedom struggle was to rid South Africa of a corrupt apartheid regime and to replace it with a regime that will protect and promote the political, social, and economic interests of all citizens. 
Unfortunately, the immorality and insensitivity of government officials, politicians and unscrupulous individuals and businesses in the private sector fail to uphold the promises of the Constitution to protect the vulnerable. According to a report of 24 June, uh, issued by Unite for Mzanzi, headed by the South African Institute of Chartered Accountants, estimated that South Africa has lost close to 1.5 billion rand through corruption between 2014 and 2019. According to Transparency International's Corruption Index, countries with a score of less than 50 out of 100 are classified as endemically corrupt. This explains South Africa's score of 44. Corruption and the legal system. George Bernard Shaw, and I hope tongue in cheek, said, justice is justice, though it's always delayed and finally done only by mistake. Sandgren correctly argued that lawyers and politicians have misunderstood the role of the law in addressing corruption by employing only criminal law for this purpose. There is a need for an array of legal rules and devices to counteract corruption. These include rules that promote transparency, checks and balances, privatization, independence of the media, procurement procedures, and taxation and competition laws. These measures are necessary to contain corruption although most of them do not have any direct bearing on corruption as such, sorry, and are not seen as anti-corruption measures. South Africa indeed has a large arsenal of anti-corruption legislative measures which criminalizes corrupt behavior, targets the proceeds of corrupt activities, and provides for severe criminal sanctions to be imposed on perpetrators. These measures include inter alia the Prevention and Combating of Corrupt Activities Act, the Prevention of Organized Crime Act, the Financial Intelligence Act, Municipal Finance Management Act, the Public Finance Management Act, the Promotion of Administrative Justice Act, and the Protected Disclosures Act. Despite these measures and harsh, harsh sanctions the courts may impose, we have hardly seen any prosecutions for corrupt activities under the Zuma regime. Cameron correctly states that crime is not deterred by harsh sentences. What does make the difference is the likelihood that criminals will be caught for their crimes and prosecuted and punished. It is also now abundantly clear that the MPA was captured and that decisions to prosecute or not were subject to political interference from those power from those in power. This is also evident from the extraordinary changes in the NPA leadership, which will hopefully be a thing of the past following the appointment of Advocate Shamila Batoy on the 1st of February 2019. The independence of our judiciary is generally regarded as above board, but political influence impacted negatively on the efficiency of the implementation of anti-corruption legislative measured, measures and the prosecution of these acts. It's been com commented that South Africa is in the midst of an anti-corruption reckoning as it attempts to deal with numerous corruption-related scandals involving political and business leadership. President Ramaphosa has however taken a stuff stance against corruption and introduced the following measures the enhancement of the SIU and introducing measures focusing on the recovery of misappropriate state resources, the establishment of a multidisciplinary anti-corruption directorate within the NPA to investigate and prosecute high-level corruption, and by replacing the leadership of key governmental bodies such as the NPA, South African Revenue Services, the State Security Agency and the Directorate for priority crime investigation. The fact that prominent political leaders and corrupt officials and those in the private sectors who collude with them 
have now been prosecuted brings additional challenges, such as the protection of whistleblowers, the safeguarding of and preservation of evidence, the protection of investigators, prosecutors, and even presiding officers. The SIU report into digital vibes COVID-19 corruption was released by the presidency on 29 September 2021 after it was in possession of the President since June 2021. This report implicates a number of senior National Department of Health officials, including the former Health Minister, Dr. Zwelim Kize, as well as the owners of Digital Vibes. It is submitted that what is called for now is the institution of criminal prosecutions against public officials, corrupt operators in the private sector, and politicians involved in corrupt activities. The old legal maxim, justice must not only be done, but be seen to be done, must be adhered to. In this regard, Max de Priya posted the following tweet on Twitter. The most astonishing phenomenon of 2019 is that the utterly corrupt who helped steal hundreds of billions and destroyed SOEs and the criminal justice system are still strutting around unashamedly in public as if the last nine years never happened, and we let them. Since 1994, the only noteworthy prosecutions for corruption by public figures were the conviction of Tony Yengeni, the former ANC parliamentary whip, who was convicted of fraud, Zuma's financial advisor Shabir Sheikh for soliciting a bribe, the 20, 2005 Travelgate scandal where members of parliament used parliamentary travel vouchers fraudulently and were prosecuted. And then the former National Police Commissioner and ex-president of Interpol, Jackie Salebe, was charged and co convicted of corruption. And we also now see that some of those involved in the looting of the VBS Mutual Bank have been charged. The recent arrest of Ace Mahashule and other officials in the so-called asbestos scandal is indicative of the fact that we might be slowly but surely entering the criminal prosecution phase of the fight against corruption. Due to the poor past leadership in the NPA and the resultant tarnished reputation of the office, many experienced prosecutors left the NPA. Efforts should be made to re-recruit -rec experienced prosecutors who can be appointed to lead these prosecutions. They can also mentor and train inexperienced prosecutors to produce a new generation of skilled prosecutors. These prosecutions should further be investigated by a multidisciplinary team consisting of lawyers, accountants, forensic investigators and detectives. These type of prosecutions proved very successful when the Scorpions were still in existence. They were however disbanded by Parliament on the 23rd of October 2008 under the leadership of former President Zuma because they might have been too effective and they were also a threat to state capture. Mechanisms should further be developed to minimize the cat and mouse tactics Placed by, played by most accused charged with, corrupt, with, with corruption. Frivolous applications are sometimes brought, brought by legal representatives in high-profile trials of accused who are charged with corruption. Everyone is entitled to a fair trial, but the legal system cannot be manipulated by trivial and fanciful procedures. In this regard, presiding officers should keep in mind that they are in control of their courts. Unnecessary repetitions of points already argued and reference to irrelevant issues should be curtailed by presiding officer, officers. Keeping litigants focused on the issues at hand cannot be viewed as a limitation of the Audi Ultram Partem principle or the right to a fair trial. Court time should not be wasted by paper wars and the filing of voluminous documents such as heads of argument. In some divisions of our high courts, practice directives were issued to curtail opposed motion court proceedings. 
practice directive 9.4 of the KwaZulu Natal High Court, for instance, limit the length of heads of argument, require the filing of a brief summary of the facts indicating which facts are common cause and not in dispute, require an indication where the material disputes of facts exist, and a list of the disputed facts. In recent trials that were broadcasted, witnesses were subjected to protracted periods of cross-examination, in some instances lasting for days on end. This form of cross-examination does not contribute to truth-finding. It mainly confuses, humiliates, or belittles witnesses. The oft-quoted caution, cross-examination does not mean to examine crossly, comes to mind. Presiding officers should also curtail meaningless cross-examination, which serves no purpose. Lastly, it is submitted that our witness protection program and protection of whistleblowers should be improved to afford more protection to these vulnerable witnesses. The intimidation or elimination of whistleblowers and state witnesses undermine the criminal justice system as it may lead to the acquittal of perpetrators. In this regard, I quote Deputy Judge President Zondu. It seems to me that providing a lot of protection to whistleblowers is critical, is a critical pillar to the meaningful fight against corruption. If people who want to engage in corruption know that there's a good chance that somebody might blow the whistle, that does contribute to deterrence. So, the country needs to have a good and strong regime of protection of whistleblowers. The next thing you want is that those who engage in corruption must know that when the whistle has been blown, the law enforcement agencies have a good chance of doing an investigation and catching them. And the third thing is that there will be prosecutions and people sent to jail. If any of these pillars is weak, it compromises the fight against corruption. Part six, concluding remarks. And this takes us far into the future now. From the movie Star Wars, um, one um, character says, but the politics as well, the contamination of greed reaches deep and far within the Republic. Corporation, trade guilds, too many senators serving their own interests. And then Patmay Amidala says, there are still those of us who work to overcome the corruption and believe it to be possible. Being personally involved in the fight against corruption since completing my legal studies, first as a prosecutor and later as an academic and anti-corruption course developer and trainer, one might become disillusioned by the picture painted in this lecture. There are, however, those heroes that um, inspire us to continue with the fight against corruption in South Africa. This is a fight we can never give up on. On Monday, 23 August this year, Babuta Diu Karan, a senior Gauteng Health Department official, was gunned down outside her home in Johannesburg, minutes after dropping off a child at school. She was a key witness in the investigation into the 233 million corrupt PPE deals in the department. The spokesperson for the Special Investigative Unit, when asked why she had no formal witness protection, said, um, there was never an indication of a threat she alerted us to. Her brother commented, we are very proud of her, her bravery and integrity. The day she was assassinated, we know she died as a hero. We are hoping that the perpetrators are found and brought to book. Her daughter is traumatized. I dedicate this lecture to heroes like Babuto believed that it is possible for us to root out the corruption. And lastly, I wish to dedicate this lecture to my late parents, specifically my mother, um, who was a qualified nursing sister and cared for the elderly until she was 70. I thank you.
Professor Dion Erasmus, it is an absolute pleasure and privilege uh, to congratulate you on a thought-provoking inaugural lecture where you shared your thoughts with us on corruption, state capture, and the betrayal of South Africa's vulnerable. Congratulations on your contribution over many years as an academic in the higher education sector and your impact in the global and national legal fraternity. Intrigued by your six-part analysis, including your concluding remarks, dating corruption back from many moons ago, I dare say that it is clear that corruption hampers sustainable development and by default the goals that we set ourselves as a country but also the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Indeed, under conditions of corruption and diminished state capacity, nations fail to eradicate poverty, address hunger, secure good health care, and high quality education for their citizens. They fail to guarantee gender equality and other human rights. They fail to reduce inequality and so on. As you have clearly articulated with examples in our own country. With these examples, you intelligently shared your thoughts and shown that corruption limits the realization of all forms of development and progress in many respects. As the vast sums that are lost to corruption could have been used to improve living standards by increasing access to housing, health, education, water, and all other services. You have particularly excelled as a researcher. In addition, you are actively engaged in your profession to enhance its knowledge base and in transferring competences to those working in the law profession. In this regard, you certainly are an embodiment of the university's ethos to be in the service of society. I would say to your family, they're very lucky and privileged to have you. Your work is a true reflection of locally enabled and globally impactful. We are truly privileged to have you at Nelson Mandela University. In closing, I would like to convey our thanks to those who attended this inaugural lecture virtually. Your interest in Professor Erasmus's work and that of Nelson Mandela University is highly appreciated. Thanks to our Vice Chancellor, Professor Sibongile Mutua, for the opening remarks and words of welcome and to the Acting Executive Dean, Professor Lynn Biggs of the Faculty of Law and for introducing uh, Professor Erasmus to us this evening. Last, by no means least, thank to the, thanks to the team uh, from the Registrar's Office, our communications and marketing team, and our ICT team that made the virtual inaugural lecture possible. Your hard work is highly appreciated and acknowledged on behalf of the President of Alumni Association, please receive warm congratulations from the association. You are already a member of the alumni, but you are welcome officially in this new capacity. And this brings to a close the inaugural lecture of Professor Dion Erasmus. You all have a good evening. Thank you.